Good afternoon. My name is Cristiano Gianola. I am uh, coordinating this event that is virtually taking place at the Center for Social Studies of the University of Coimbra with our uh, guest uh, speaker, uh, Professor Marianna Griffini from Northwestern University, London. Thank you all for being here and welcome to this event of the UNPOP series on emotions and populism. Um, is a series that is long lasting already has the project, uh, the research project that is financed by the Foundation for Science and Technology in Portugal and started in 2021 uh, 20, uh, and will go on for until next year. We are going to have um, a big event uh, in January, uh, as some of you may know, and uh, um, this um, the event of today is part of a series of seminars that we uh, started in 2021 and is going on uh, until next year as well. I'm going to share for those of you who are not acquainted with the project, the link to um, the website that we created with all our activities where you can find also the recordings of the previous events of this series under um, uh, media uh, section in populism and emotions. To be sure, I also shared this. I also shared this um, link here. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here today with um, Professor Marianne Griffini from Northwestern University and uh, with a very uh, interesting and entangled topic that uh, covers many areas that uh, uh, are of interest for our project as well. In fact, Marianne is a collaborator in the UNPOP project. And we're just sorry that we are not having this event in presence in Coimbra, but we are also happy that uh, this format can allow the uh, participation from people that are uh, that would not be uh, possibly uh, present if the event would be in person. So Marianna um, holds a PhD in European and International Studies from uh, King's College London, and she uh, is Assistant Professor in International Relations and Anthropology uh, at the Northwestern University in London. In between 2020 and 2023, she was um, a lecturer at the Department of uh, European and International Studies of King's College uh, in London. And she is uh, the Deputy Director of the Center for Italian Politics um, at the European and International Studies uh, from King's College London. Her research uh, and teaching interests uh, are on party politics, populism, internal, uh, institutionalization, especially Italian politics, democracy. And she has broadly published in journals like European Politics and Society, Journal of Visual Culture, the Italian Journal of Electoral Studies, Participazione e Conflitto, and she contributed influential chapters in a renowned uh, edited book. Today, she is going to uh, present uh, uh, the topic of uh, today's event in relation to her la latest book uh, that, is, that was published by Rutledge earlier this year which title is The Politics of Memory in the Italian Populist Radical Right from Mare Nostrum to Mare Vostrum. I'm going to, while Mariana is going to be speaking, I'm going to share information uh, about the book and a link. Without further ado, Mariana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Cristiano, and thank you very much, everyone, for being here. I can see some familiar faces of students and colleagues. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you here. 
Um, so today, as Cristiano was mentioning, I like to present my book online. I gave a an in person presentation in London in May, and we had uh, Luca Manucci that works uh, um, in um, with Cristiano to a certain extent as well. Uh, so at the University of Lisbon, sorry, not in Coimbra, just to just to clarify. Uh, I would like also to make a very brief clarification that um, I work now at Northeastern University London. So um, now the my email address is also different from the one that um, has been circulated before. I can drop it in the chat. Uh, okay. So without further ado, I'd like to start this presentation by um, reminding you of a picture that we have seen around circulating in newspapers and online uh, in the spring. When Giorgia Meloni, the now prime minister of Italy, visited Ethiopia. Uh, during her official diplomatic visit, she meant to establish a solid connection with Ethiopia that used to be an Italian colony during fascist colonial times. And at the same time, she projected herself as the uh, carrier of a good, as she was saying, a good kind of development, I am quoting, that is not predatory. Um, and she was uh, priding herself on the fact that Italians have been very good at cooperating without actually uh, exploiting populations. While she didn't make any direct reference to colonialism, she was mainly speaking about contemporary times, a journalist actually dared ask her, but what about colonial ties with Italy? And uh, she brushed off this question, this journalist question, uh, saying that it's past. So col the, the Italian colonial experience has been boxed in the past. And I think that this is quite interesting because it will encapsulate the conundrum that I'm trying to entangle in my book. Uh, Cristiano has been sending or is will send the the link to my book that has been published through Outlet and also there's a, and then the self publicity will stop there. There's also a no sort um discount code from Routledge or 20% uh, should you wish to order it through your library, for instance, or for yourself. Um, so my book started, the project started well before what happened, of course, in the spring. Uh, it started in 2016 and uh, it is, uh, um, it started with my PhD. Uh, it ended in uh, um, before 2020, so in 2019, but for the book, I've been updating the book with also interviews and data collected up to 2021, you know, uh, in order to cover also pandemic times. Uh, what am I looking for? What was I looking for? What was the puzzle there? So. I already sketched the picture. We have uh, on one side the populist radical right. In this case, it was represented by the current prime minister, minister sorry, Giorgia Meloni, heading Fratelli d'Italia or Brothers of Italy in English. On the other hand, we had the colonial question. How can these two quite different concepts and themes be reconciled? How can they come together in a book or in, in a PhD, in a research? Usually colonialism and the populist radical right have been treated separately. Also the question of memory has not been really prominent um, in uh, academic scholarship when you deal with the populist radical right. Even if we've had uh, some debate about the fascist legacy in the populist radical right nowadays. Um, so how did I come up with this idea? I noticed that in other countries, for instance, in France, in Belgium, in the United Kingdom, um, in the Netherlands, there was more public debate and also academic debate about the role that colonial memory may play in anti-immigrant sentiment. 
And as the populist radical right in Italy is the prime example of anti-migrant sentiment in the Italian milieu, then I thought, why um, shouldn't I try to understand if colonial memory has any impact in the articulation of immigrants of the other in the populist radical right in Italy? So this is um, the explanation for the highly sounding title that was actually um, adapted for market purposes, thanks to thanks to Routledge. Uh, the subtitle is um, from Mare Nostrum to Mare Vostrum. And the subtitle, um, I, I took just a, a license, an author's license in using Vostrum instead of Vestrum, that would be the correct Latin version of your, um, just for market purposes, again, in order to create an, an assonance. Why from Mare Nostrum to Mare Vostrum? Again, even the subtitle traces the continuity in the figure of the Mediterranean. So the Mediterranean in colonial and fascist times was a very treasured space for aggrandizement, for expansion, in order to conquer what was called the Oltremare. The Oltremare was the, the, the set of Italian colonies in uh, the African continent. Italy had already acquired uh, Libya, uh, Eritrea and Somalia before the advent of fascism. And then we know uh, famously that, or infamously, that fascism, um, fascist Italy conquered Ethiopia. So this was the Mare Nostrum in colonial and fascist times, a very treasured space for expansion, part of the living space of the organic national community of Italy. But nowadays, the Mediterranean has been often seen by the populist radical right, definitely, as a distant space. So it's no more our space, Nostrum, but it has become, according to my conceptualization, a mare bosom, so your sea. Um, basically, uh, also in the very recent agreements between Meloni and uh, um, Northern Africa, we can see that the Mediterranean has been relegated to an inferior position and the responsibility for what happens in the Mediterranean with reference to migrant flows has been allocated to third countries, so the countries of origin of immigrants, sometimes also to, to the European um, Union, but this has to do with the complex relationship between the populist radical right and the UN, we can discuss it more later on if you are interested in it with some questions. So not to go off track, let's go back to our Mare Nostrum versus Mare Vostrum, so your own sea. Um, we can see this continuity then in the conceptualization of the Mediterranean. We can see continuity at the, sorry, um, continuity in the centrality of the Mediterranean in discourse, this continuity between the fascist and the populist radical right articulation of the Mediterranean. We also have another continuity, which is uh, uh, nativism. So the time of fasc uh, fascism was, uh, and colonialism was utter racism. Now, uh, for instance, Karl Smudy and the scholarship on the populist radical right has repackaged this, uh, sorry, this racism along with nationalism into the concept of nativism that holds that Italy, in this case, or the nation, the nation state, should be inhabited mainly by natives. So in this case, we have an in-group, the Italians, that is constructed in opposition to an out-group, the immigrants, lumped together. Um, these immigrants, the immigrants that the populist radical right mainly targets with its nativism are the immigrants coming through the Mediterranean onto the Italian shores. And last week we witnessed um, very sadly um, the, um, the shipwrecks and then arrival of migrants uh, um, to Lampedusa. So that was an unprecedented number of migrants disembarking on Lampedusa, but also migrants 
um, finding their death in the Mediterranean Sea. This is just to contextualize how topical the Mediterranean is now. Um, so going back to continuities and discontinuities, um, I have explained why I make this connection between colonialism and the populist radical right, the centrality of the Mediterranean, at the same time, the difference in its conceptualization. This difference is imbued with nativism uh, that recalls, of course, with due differentiation that we can discuss later on, uh, racism. So the fascist colonizer was conceptualizing the Italian identity against the colonized other. Um, but why uh, did I pick the populist radical rights? Couldn't I pick another party that, that has, that nurtures anti-immigrant racism? Um, anti-immigrant sentiment. So as I said, the populist radical right is the prime example in Italy that makes nativism one of its rallying cries. Nativism has spread also beyond the confines of the populist radical right. Um, the mainstream right has adopted, has co-opted some strands of the nativism of the populist radical right. Um, the Five Star Movement has that sort of um, ambivalent position, but is not immune um, to some nativist trends. And um, but I picked the populist radical right not just because of its prime position in the nativist uh, panorama of Italy, but also because uh, Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, is genealogically linked to um, fascism, to the fascist party. Why? Because uh, just after the demise of, of fascism, the Movimento Sociale Italiano, so the Italian social movement, emerged as the first neo-fascist party in post-World War, uh, Second World War Italy. The Movimento Sociale Italiano then went through different evolutions, and uh, when it was uh, dismantled, its legacy was uh, collected and uh, taken upon by Alleanza Nazionale, so National Alliance. Alleanza Nazionale tried to, um, make, to distance itself from the so-called doganamento uh, from the neo clearly neo-fascist heritage of the Movimento Sociale Italiano. Whether it was successful or not is debatable, but what interests us is genealogy. So let's trace the genealogy from fascism to the Movimento Sociale Italiano to Alleanza Nazionale and finally to Fratelli d'Italia, Brothers of Italy, that is uh, the um, recreation, regeneration of uh, Alleanza Nazionale. So from the ashes of Alleanza Nazionale after its death, um, uh, Fratelli d'Italia was formed, was founded by Giorgia Meloni that still leads the party. Another founder is uh, Ignazio La Russa, that's today the Speaker of the Senate. I'm just giving you these um, two names in order to understand the prominence of Fratelli d'Italia in government nowadays and the fact that these two key figures in the Italian political system carry the legacy of the first neo-fascist party in post-World War Italy. Indeed, um, Giorgia Meloni um, is too young, but Ignazio La Russa experienced the membership in the Movimento Sociale Italiano. These are the Prime Minister, the current Prime Minister and the Speaker of the Senate. Okay, so now I have justified why I picked colonial memory that is entangled necessarily with fascist, uh, with fascist memory as fascism represented the peak, the acme of Italian colonialism. And I justified why I picked the populist radical right, why I chose uh, the Mediterranean and anti-immigrant sentiment nativism as the trade union between the two. Uh, I have to say that um, the populist radical right now is uh, um, known best uh, through Fratelli d'Italia, but for ages, for decades, since the early 90s, um, it has been composed also of the Lega. The Lega is totally different from Fratelli Italia regarding its genealogy. It originated as a regionalist party advocating the 
uh, at some point the secession, at some point the autonomy of the so-called imaginary community of Padania, corresponding roughly to, to north of Italy. Um, the Lega has been leading, um, actually, the populist radical right until Meloni came to prominence. So she uh, was, Meloni with Fratelli d'Italia had always been in opposition until they won the elections almost exactly one year ago. Uh, Salvini, the leader of uh, the Lega, uh, didn't really, I don't think that really accepted this loss. And at the moment, uh, the Italian political scene is dominated by the leader, so Giorgia Meloni with Fratelli d'Italia, Prime Minister, Majority Party in Government, and also a, a sort of a com competing figure of Salvini. That's the leader of the Lega, that now is a nationalist party, no more a regionalist party, and uh, um, that advocates similar policies to the ones advocated by Meloni, but I can see that um, the image of the Lega has changed now, um, from the Lega that I used to work with, so my own Lega interviewees. Um, at, at that time, the Lega still saw itself as the um, major, as the leading party in the populist radical right. Indeed, they held power um, in government with the um, Five Star Movement, for instance. Uh, but it was very surely it was lived. Um, but at the same time, Nowadays, the Lega, um, I think that is suffering from its minority position within the government. So I I notice some differences between now it's sort of the team, the Lega that tries to rise again against Meloni and the then Lega that was the populist radical right party, while Fratelli d'Italia was the rising party, but the rise was quite progressive in time. Um, so uh, how I already mentioned interviewees, so as you may have understood, I um, I conducted semi-structured elite interviews with uh, the representatives of the Lega and of Fratelli d'Italia between 2016 and 2021. So there were two waves of interviews. I also analyzed party manifestos, but the most interesting results were actually yielded by the interviews. And um, what I found, uh, first of all, apart from the corollary ideologies of anti-elitism, of uh, nationalism, of course, of reactionary values that we can discuss later on, uh, the core of my findings revolved around one, the conceptualization of the immigrant that nowadays uh, reiterates some colonial um, topoi, so it reiterates colonial rhetoric. On the other hand, uh, regarding colonial memory, it has been remanaged, it has been repackaged, and it is a very selective memory of colonialism that picks only what are deemed to be the most positive aspects of colonialism, but even in uh, dealing with the most positive aspects, we have to be careful that there has been a revision, of course, of the past. Uh, starting with the first block, so how does uh, colonial memory come up? How does colonialism come up in the uh, populist radical right nativism? So how they conceive the immigrants? Uh, comparing the literature on colonialism and the colonial attitude towards the colonized other, with the literature on the current nativism of the populist radical right against immigrants and triangulating that with my interviews, I um, created six categories. So in the problematization and the differentiation of immigration, colonial echoes um, do not really um, come up much. So the first one, of course, um, portrays immigration as a problem of insurmountable magnitude that is throwing Italy into chaos due to economic and sociocultural issues. Um, through the differentiation of immigration, my interviewees were moderating, trying to moderate their own position by arguing that 
some immigrants, and that's also the territory that, that's around now when they are talking about possible naval blockades or agreements with third countries. So they were arguing that only some immigrants are welcome, the refugees that are fleeing from true wars. So they were uh, telling me, for instance, oh, but I never heard that in Senegal or in Nigeria, we have a war. So why are they coming here? Uh, but we would welcome Syrians, for instance. So I noticed, apart from a, a limited knowledge, geopolitical knowledge, um, I noticed that there has been um, a focus, a selective focus on which countries can send immigrants and which immigrants we, we as the populist radical right, we are going to welcome. A similar discourse can be applied to um, Ukrainian refugees uh, during the aggression of um, Russia in Ukraine, but that's again another uh, another topic that I haven't explored in the book. But that's that's very interesting because there are some parallels that can be traced there. Um, so, but let's move on to the four categories where colonial echoes are uh, um, are really evident. So, first of all, immigrants are othered. So, through the othering of immigrants, they are treated as the colonizers were behaving towards the colonized other. So they are others in cultural terms. They are others in religious terms. Um, Islamophobia is rampant in the populist radical right. And they are also others in economic terms. So um, for example, my interviews were arguing that immigrants are uh, stealing our jobs, and that's the usual uh, rhetoric that's around their slogan. But um, what was interesting during the pandemic, for instance, is that they were arguing that um, during the crisis brought about by the pandemic, the fact that immigrants were competing with Italians uh, by charging their labor at much lower rates was destructive for the economy, for the Italian economy, and was bringing about unemployment of the Italians that had already gone through the, the troubles of the COVID pandemic. So they may have lost their job. So here we can see how the immigrant is an other, right? And, and this othering of immigrants is of course pejorative, right? So again, they are seeing our jobs, they are charging their labor at very low, low rates. So for instance, they were um, assimilated, they were compared to slaves. So my my interviewees were saying, um, yes, they, they work like slaves, but this doesn't mean that also Italians need to work like slaves at with very cheap labor in order to get a job. So immigrants were deemed to be lower in let's say the um, also the the working conditions of Italians, not just the salary of Italians. Uh, regarding culture, that's that's very um, evident again in the slogans today and my interviews, I'm picking just on, on some on some interview quotes. My interviews, for instance, were saying, well, we used to go to the park in the evening, but nowadays uh, we feel foreigners in our own country. And, uh, um, or for instance, one interviewee was very concerned because his uh, nephew, I guess a, a teenager or even younger than a teenager, um, had never been to the Uffizi, so the, the famous art museum in Florence, but was uh, singing uh, songs produced by immigrants uh, in Italy. And by that, there may be uh, Bello Figo that um, I remember that Gaia Giuliani was here in the audience uh, analyzed. Um, or I think Gali. So, I mean, I'm not an expert in, in uh, the current Italian pop music, but these are the, some examples. So they were concerned even about the spread of culture coming from immigrants in different forms, in this case, uh, through music. Um, other common concerns that are probably less interesting and that we have we may have heard of more, um, more often are the fact that, for instance, uh, um, Muslim immigrants uh, 
hold completely different traditions from the Italian ones and according to the populist radical right. And these traditions actually uh, link to another category that is the inferiorization of immigrants. So like the uh, colonizer that was treating the colonized other as inferior, irrational, um, not able to, to behave, and often even um, ill, not just in physical terms, but also in mental terms. So our populist radical right interviewees um, were um, arguing that, for instance, uh, immigrant men do not let immigrant woman, women, the, um, sorry, Muslim men in Italy don't let Muslim women uh, drive their car or they limit their liberties, uh, generally speaking, or they raise the question of the veil. Uh, it, it was very evident that the populist radical right wanted to portray itself as the defender of civic values, for instance, uh, the value of secularism, uh, but at the same time, this was uh, strategic. I believe that this discourse was strategic because it was a way to cover otherwise um, apparently very evidently native discourse under a mantle of civicness, of acceptability, of legitimacy. And this happened uh, in general when they were inferiorizing immigrants, not just uh, the Muslim, but they were saying in general that, for instance, immigrants do not have respect for their own lives. They don't have respect for freedoms. And um, again, a pejorative view of immigrants that, that comes out you know, in, um, in an absolutely um, clear way in the criminalization of immigrants. So I already mentioned the fact that immigrants are stealing jobs, apparently. And in the criminalization of immigrants, you could really see how um, Islamophobia, as I said, is rampant, how uh, Muslim immigrants have been often lumped together as um, crusaders, so as bringing a holy war to Italy. Uh, have been linked to terrorism. And in general, my interviews were very keen on, uh, first of all, um, using sensationalist language in order to induce fear, right, of the other. On the other hand, they were very keen on demonstrating to me through statistical evidence uh, that their claims were right. So they were saying, for instance, oh, I have a friend in the police that told me that in Florence last night uh, they um, they caught uh, you know, like 60 drug smugglers and guess what? They were all immigrants. So they, they used a lot of data. Many data were discordant actually, but this is another strategy that is often used by the populist radical right in order to corroborate their claims. And finally, immigrants were seen as, as I said, as abject. So as cast off from the healthy body, healthy and clean body of the Italian nation, I call this objectification. So um, for instance, so some interviews said um, during COVID, okay, and this was quite a prominent theme, um, we have um, um, we have COVID outbreaks in immigrant hotspots because immigrants are free to disembark onto Italian shores, but at the same time, Italians have to be locked into their homes during the lockdown. So immigrants can disembark and bring um, COVID and they can go around and be um, and be spreaders. And this rhetoric actually didn't last long, I have to say, because then the focus was was mainly shifted onto um, onto the pandemic in in Italy, and there was less focus on the immigrants as carriers of the pandemic, and uh, um, not just talking about immigrants coming to Italy. Uh, also, xenophobia was widespread at the beginning of the pandemic when the Chinese even the ones resident in Italy um, and not just disembarked, uh, were thought um, of being spreaders of the COVID pandemic. Um, again, the uh, objectification and criminalization of the immigrants recall colonial tropes. So colonial tropes that have to do with treating the colonized other as dirty, as, as 
crazy, right? As mentally ill and as someone that um that whose violence is unrestrained and or that can act in a in a smart and canny way. So um, this is the, um, the ecos, these are the ecos of the colonial ecos in the populist radical right discourse. What about colonial memory? So they reproduce these colonial ecos, but at the same time, they do not recognize fully, they do not come to terms with the colonial past. So the utilization of these ecos is unintentional, I believe, but in order to understand that, we would need to conduct a political, uh, psychological research that would be very interesting, but I don't have the resources um, at that time. Uh, and um, regarding colonial memory, instead, they were really prompted my, by my questions. Otherwise, they would have never talked about it. Some of them were uncomfortable, but not that many were utterly uncomfortable to the point of having to, uh, you know, being um, conflictual or once, for instance, I cut off the interview and that, that was it. Um, so uh, they were talking, yes, when prompted, many of them were talking about colonialism, but in a positive way. So memory is, of course, always selective because we cannot remember everything. We tend to distill some elements of, of our past and those become memories. Um, in this case, of course, I didn't expect them, my interviews, to have a complete memory of, of the Italian past, but I noticed the, um, the total absence of a critical understanding, of a critical assessment of the colonial past. And the, the literature that has been applied to other geographical contexts has argued that the absence of the digestion of the colonial past has brought about more hostile behavior towards the immigrants nowadays. Um, of course, this again, this would need some quantitative uh, uh, methods to be proved and also would be very, very hard to prove again, some political uh, psychologists that work here. Uh, so I, I, I didn't want to stake any claim to causality, of course. I observed both so colonial ecos and anti-immigrant sentiment and a very selective colonial memory. And I used the, the existing literature in order to justify this link and the possible impact of this very restricted and selective colonial memory onto anti-immigrant sentiment. What I would say selective, biased memory, um, so what were they recalling of the colonial and the fascist part? They were saying, yeah, the, the usual rhetoric that also appeared in the discourse that was articulated by Meloni um, in, in the episode on the occasion that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation. So in Ethiopia, we, are good, we were good colonizers. We brought about development, uh, homes, uh, hospitals, uh, roads, uh, schools. So in general, they were very proud of infrastructure. Um, they were also very few actually um, had made the claim that they brought about civilization. But I have to say that very few uh, use this very racist rhetoric of uh, the colon colonizer, the white colonizer bringing about civilization to the inferior, objectified and animalized uh, um, colonial, col colonized others. And also what they mentioned was the fact that Italian colonizers were good at heart. So uh, there's the myth of Italiani brava gente that um, is very powerful in the interview. So this view, this partial view of Italians have as um, having been chivalrous and very courteous towards and loved by the colonizers. Uh, at the same time, so they were picking these, what they saw as positive elements of colonialism. So they were saying there's not really a link between colonialism and immigration because, you know, that we treated them well, so there's no link. Talking about other countries instead, other former colonial countries, they did understand that there was a link. So they were saying, um, yeah, but what about the UK? They colonized 
more than half of the um of the globe but and they were quite violent so does it mean that the uk now must feel guilty for its colonialism uh, does it mean that now the queen because there used to be the queen when i was interviewing them need to apologize to the whole world they also mentioned the pope uh, what about the church? Does it mean that now we are expecting the Pope to apologize to everyone in the world? So they were making these comparisons in order to reverse blame onto other countries. Um, and we have to remember also that Italy has been always um, always um, engaged in this inferiority complex vis-a-vis -vis other um, European countries. So the myth of Italiani brava gente, the inferiority complex of Italy, come up um, quite frequently. What, um, but what was the reaction when I pointed out that there had been some, some negative aspects? Um, so uh, some of them argued that, um, well, what is past is past. So we, we need to move on, okay? So they brushed off the question completely. They didn't even engage with that. Um, but I have to say that there were not the majority. So uh, also when now I talk about the interviews, I talk about the majority, what the majority says, but also with the discourse on immigration, not all of them were having, were, were um, arguing along those lines or those categories. Anyway, going back to colonial memory, so some of them were completely distancing themselves from the colonial past. Some of them were saying, um, yes, okay, if uh, there, we had, uh, committed some atrocities, violence, colonial misdeeds, then we can apologize. But there was that if, that conditional, that was putting into question whether Italian colonizers had been that bad, in, uh, in quotation marks. Um, and so regarding apologies, they could be provided according to the populist radical right, only if Italy had been ascertain to have committed those those crimes or the, in general those misdeeds, and uh, um, even in that case, uh, colonial apologies would be half-hearted and also strategic because they were saying we can apologize if we have committed that, and if that serves as a bargaining chip in order to stem migratory flows. So again, here, it was very interesting because when I asked the question about colonial apology, so do you think that Italy should apologize to the former colonies because they did it quite late and um, so apologies were not were quite lukewarm in Italy in the, in the 90s. So when I asked them, if Italy had really to apologize or not, they um they were saying they were making the connection with immigration. So these countries to which Italy, you know, they were asked to comment on whether Italy should apologize or not to these countries. These countries they were recognized immediately in their mind as the third party countries of origin of immigrants. So they were say, they were linking these colonial apologies to immigration, and this brings to our mind. Um, the, the close relationship between Berlusconi and Gheddafi and their city of friendship that was meant, that included uh, the closure of a painful chapter of the past and then quoting it, at the same time it was used to control uh, um, immigration. So just to recap in a nutshell, we have seen how uh, co colonialism is uh, present in the discourse of the populist radical right. Uh, it uh, resurfaces in the form of echoes that, are, that you understand if you probe deep into the discourse and that I categorize according to this classification. And at the same time, so on one hand, it is visibilized through these echoes. On the other hand, it, it is invisibilized when um, you talk about the colonial past. So colonial memory becomes selective. They remember only what they think was positive through a revision of the past. So they extol the positive elements of colonialism while the negative ones are brushed off or they can be remembered and they can uh, form the, uh, the motivation for apologies only if they are instrumental to the control of immigration now. Um, yeah, that that's all from me. I think that I already talked very um, a lot. Thank you very much for listening.